one of everybody's favorite commentators. You know him, you love him, Steven Crowder. Failed stand-up comedian who grifted his way to his space in, in the right wing, where he's, he's basically losing his star now because he's burnt bridges with the people from Daily Wire. Uh, he's been outed as a horrendous, abusive husband in a very public divorce. Total piece of shit. Jimmy Dore's too lazy to do his own research, and apparently he's too lazy to write a funny set as someone who likes to call himself a comedian. You know, we'll see in a second. I'll, I'll play some of his other content because he, he fashions himself a comedian. And for <laughs> Dave Rubin, his roots were in comedy and more uh, yeah. specifically, unfunny comedy. J.P. Sears is a grifter. Let's make no mistake about it. It's like, yeah, it's politically incorrect, but it's more offensive because it's just lazy. Hi, my name is Molly. And today I'm going to be practicing for my stand up comedy set. What's the deal with World War II rations? Yesterday, my mom made me eat turnips. And you know what I said? Turn up these nuts. Okay, let's try again. Yesterday, I was reading the newspaper and all the headlines were about Hitler. Hitler this, Hitler that. And I was like, Hitler, I hardly know her. Wow, nobody wants to joke anymore. You guys take everything too seriously nowadays. I'm going to go where my comedy will be appreciated. Political talk shows. Extra, extra, read all about it. I'm reporter Kit Kittridge here with today's news. Haha, <laughs> Kit is woke. Look at her short hair. She's woke. This is my show now. It's called Jokes Don't Care About Your Wokes with Molly McIntyre. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Jokes Don't Care About Your Wokes with me, Molly McIntyre. Today, we're going to be discussing the age-old question of whether or not there is any ethical consumption under capitalism. We will not be doing any stand-up comedy in today's episode, just like we didn't do any in yesterday's episode, because facts don't care about your feelings, and the fact is that when I yell about controversial shit, I make a lot more in ad revenue than when I try to tell jokes, and I enjoy the fact that I have a lot of money more than the feeling of making you guys laugh. Now, let's head into our first topic of the day. Socialists, are they gay? Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. In today's video, we're going to be discussing a lot of politically motivated content, including the ways that various creators frame their political discussions through the lenses of comedy or entertainment or even genuine news reporting. When it comes to getting our news, getting an understanding of the facts of so many complex situations going on in the world around us, it can sometimes start to feel a little bit exhausting, a little bit difficult, since at the end of the day, all reporters, all political commentators, all journalists and writers, they're all human and all human humans have emotions and biases that can sometimes even unconsciously meld into their work. And on a more cynical level, yeah, oftentimes these reporters are also working for news organizations that have some serious money tied up in the motivation to report things one way or another. And that's why today I'm really excited to be sponsored by a company that I think is doing some of the best work out there to make sure that we as readers can get more than one perspective in our consumption of the news. Today's video is sponsored by Ground News, an app that I've honestly loved using even before they reached out to sponsor me, which is one reason that I was so excited to say yes to promoting them. I actually used Ground News for a lot of my initial research that I did for that four hour long video back in September about the lies behind the movie The Blind Side. You guys should watch that video if you haven't already. Ground News is a website and app that includes over 50,000 news sources from across the political spectrum, allowing users to directly compare headlines, see who owns the source of each story, and show you which stories tend to have bias towards one end of the political spectrum spectrum or another. And Ground News is an app that I've seen promoted by creators whose worldviews come from all different areas of the political spectrum. No matter what level of knowledge that you have about certain world news issues or what preconceived notions or biases you're coming into the issue with, it's important that we all have access to the most factual news possible and that we all learn how to identify when a news story is pushing a certain agenda or whether a publication is using creatively worded headlines to prime your opinion of the topic before you even read the article. It can be pretty clear how differently multiple news sources might report on similar or even identical topics. And if you're used to getting your news from the same sources over and over again, you can see how easy it is not to notice the ways that those sources insert their own bias into their reporting, whether subtly or overtly. In my experience, Ground News has been a fantastic way to see how certain publications report on different stories, what details they choose to share, what details they choose to omit, whether I need to seek out additional sources to fill in those gaps, and whether two sources might just be in direct conflict with 
each other, or whether a source might be outright lying, or whether a source is trying to manipulate its readers. In some cases, left-leaning sources might report on a topic that right-leaning sources are completely ignoring, or vice versa. And Ground News has a feature for this very phenomenon. It's called Blind Spot, and you can sort by all, or for the left, or for the right. The For the Left tab, for example, provides stories that are almost exclusively covered by right-leaning sources, so at the very least, even if you disagree with the reporting or the conclusions drawn, you're still aware of what's going on and what people with your opposing worldview are talking about. For example, since I tend to be a more left-leaning person, I can use the Blind Spot feature to find out what stories are being solely covered by right-leaning news outlets. That way, I'm not left completely in the dark about those stories. Here's an example. One story Ground News showed me that has 0% left-leaning coverage is this. GOP AGs blast Biden admin for foster care plan they say would effectively ban Christians. All the headlines were framing the story in a similar type of way, that Biden's administration was somehow going to ban Christians from participating in foster care. Was this true? Well, when looking at the news site The Blaze, which Ground News identifies as a right-leaning source, it says, The rule indicates steps agencies must abide by to meet the requirement for LGBTQI plus children, and then explains the rules that agencies have to follow in order to provide a home for that child. So from this, I've learned that a lot of right-wing sources in this particular case are equating Christians with people who don't support the LGBTQ community, despite the fact that I personally know many LGBTQ-affirming Christians myself, which directly shows how these sources have spun the headline through the biases of the people and the publications reporting on it. If you couldn't tell, I can't say enough good things about this app and the ways that it helps foster critical thinking in our consumption of the news. So if you're interested in trying out Ground News for yourself, go ahead and check out the link in my description below. Go to https colon slash slash ground dot news slash savvy to check it out. For a limited time, subscribe through my link to get the Vantage plan for 30% off. This is the plan that I use and it's given me unlimited access to important features such as the blind spot feed that I mentioned. When you subscribe, you're not only supporting me and my channel, you're also supporting an independent platform trying to make the news more transparent. I hope you all have a great time using Ground News and keeping up to date on everything going on all around us. Now, let's talk about some political commentators inserting their own opinions into their coverage online. A few months ago, I made a deep dive on Steven Crowder, the man who identifies as a comedian despite not being biologically funny, and in that video I mentioned that Crowder's trajectory seems to have been a somewhat common one. The failed comedian to political commentator pipeline. When what you really want to do is be a comedian, entertain crowds with jokes, and make it as an entertainer whose goal is laughs and joy at all costs, but that field is too hard to earn a living in, well, sometimes it's easier to go the political commentator route. After all, on the internet, negativity sells. Outrage is a lot quicker to capitalize on than laughs. And in a lot of cases, these comedians have completely tossed aside their initial goals to be entertainers in favor of solely focusing on being a serious political commentator, but with a few jokes thrown in here and there just so that they can say that they're still comedians. Now there is a lot of political comedy that we could cover in this video, but to keep the scope of this video somewhat reasonable, I'm only going to talk about people who started in comedy and then grifted to political commentary, and now primarily do serious political commentary with occasional comedy thrown in. I'm not going to talk about specific- I'm not going to talk about the specific subgenre of political comedians, meaning we're not going to discuss shows like The Daily Show or comedians like Trevor Noah or Jon Stewart or Stephen Colbert or any of them. The reason being those shows are kind of parodies of new shows and they're just a different genre than the kind of political commentary and the kind of former stand-up comedian type of thing I'm talking about. I also want to give one other disclaimer and that's that comedy is obviously subjective. We all laugh at different things. As I've mentioned before, I like to laugh at things just being loud. Loud noises! I sometimes have baby brain when it it comes to what makes me laugh. For real, I can just like watch videos of people screaming the lyrics to songs and I'll be rolling on the floor laughing. Like I literally laugh so hard that I start crying. Like full tears are coming out of my eyes just from videos of people randomly screaming at nothing. So I'm definitely not one to be the joke police. If any of the comedians I discussed today are people that you personally find funny, 
Live your life, bro. Laugh at whatever you want to laugh at. I don't care. But there is something to be said for comedians whose work becomes lazy, and instead of spending time developing better jokes or funnier delivery, those comedians take the easy route and instead decide to start making outrage content covering current events, sharing primarily their real opinions with only a few jokes thrown in after the fact on the side, if even that. So let's talk about one of the first comedians on this list, probably the one who was the least funny to begin with and still isn't funny now, and that is our old pal, Dave Rubin. Dave Rubin is the host of the show The Rubin Report, which includes interviews with controversial figures, discussions of current political and cultural issues within the U.S., and more. Dave Rubin started off his career as a left-leaning reporter, having worked on the leftist web show The Young Turks before making an exodus when he, in his words, left the left. At least that's a pun, that's like the closest thing to a joke he has. And now he instead mostly hangs out with right-wing commentators like Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Candace Owens, that whole crowd. If you want more of an in-depth discussion on Dave Rubin and the fact that he's most likely a huge grifter who doesn't actually believe in anything, then you should check out my two-part video reviewing his book, Don't Burn This Book, which I put out back in October of 2021. But above all else, above the talk show he hosts filled with serious discussions, above his work as a talking head on various political news shows that aren't parodies of anything, Dave Rubin identifies as a comedian. What are you two crazy bitches talking about? Jesus. What are you talking about? You want to arrest people who are different than you politically? Tulsi Gabbard? She's a member of our military. She's a former congresswoman, a Democrat. You just don't like her, so you want to arrest her? You want to arrest Tucker Carlson, the very dapper Tucker Carlson. I, what are you saying? You you guys are nuts. You're you're just nuts. I only agreed to do this show because I thought that Whoopi Whoopi was sane. She was good. Sister Act, Sister Act Two. Anna's just nuts. I don't even know what she's doing here. And the other one's a racist. And, the, and the, there's the drunk one. I, what what is what are we all doing here? <sighs> So while watching this, I actually forgot that I was watching Dave Rubin and I thought I was watching Steven Crowder for like a solid 30 seconds of that. So here, Dave is just pretending to be a woman on the talk show with The View. And to show that he's a woman, he's wearing a wig. But he's not parodying her in how bad he thinks The View's talking points are. He's making his own points that he actually agrees with, but doing it with an accent as if he's having the character he's playing make those points. Okay, with you so far. So are the points he's making supposed to sound like a ridiculous parody, or are we supposed to actually take them seriously? Now, believe it or not, this is actually one of Dave Rubin's better pieces of commentary. Dave's skits leave a lot to be desired, but his stand-up work is basically unwatchable. This is very exciting. Hot Gay Comics Live for television. Uh, by a sh uh, show of hands, how many of you have televisions? <laughs> have you have a... Pretty good, okay. And how many of you have the Here Network? Okay, we've got some work to do, but we're... Right, pause it. Very good. So do we have... Oh, Solid right. minute of pause crowd it. work. Solid yeah. minute of crowd work. All right, so yeah. right now what we have... <laughs> We have a solid minute of the crowd work, product placement, and identity politics, and no laughs. So here, Dave is doing a stand-up show called Hot Gay Comics. What Dave is attempting to do here is crowd work, to involve the audience in the performance, to improvise funny responses to what they say. But Dave seems unable to come up with anything to say after he asks the audience each question. Very good. So do we have all gay people? Is everyone here gay? <laughs> imagine. Gay. Why would you say that? Very good, very good. Do we have some... A lot of discussion. Like, did some of you just come out right then? Did I should tell you I'm gay. We're at a gay show. I thought this would be a good way of doing it. Do Pause we have some it. lesbians? I sense, I sense lesbians in the crowd tonight. Uh, I just have to say, to be fair, there is a through line, because Dave actually still does this, where he's just sort of like... Hey, you have uh, new research that says that uh, Chicanos have a slower cranium and therefore they can't do liberal democracy. Uh, explain that to me. And um, I'm gay. Any gays here? Any lesbians here? Any moms here? Any dads here? Any humans here? Any aliens here? Any babies here? How long is this bit going to keep going? Forever. The main thing people like about crowd work is hearing the comedian's responses. If he says, any lesbians here and some lesbians raise their hands, he should then come up with something funny to say to those audience members in response. Maybe a joke about them. Break out the L word. Or a joke about lesbians. A lesbian. Or like just a joke in general. The other L word. Lesbians. Well, I, I should ask about the... Wait, did he forget 
Was his joke book stolen really? 30 that was, years ago? Really? That was proportionately <laughs> powerful. Oh my God! This is all identity politics. Really, that many straight here, you sir? Obviously, straight with your four chicks and ugh. <laughs> ugh, a lot of straight people. Really, I was gonna just have play security it out. remove like three or four of you, but I guess yeah, just we can't do that. Do we have any any gays in relationships, or as I like to call them, gays from the future? <laughs> You two, look at the way you're sitting. You guys are mounting each other in love. So now we have gathered that Dave is not in fact a comedian, but is in fact working for the U.S. Census Bureau gathering data. Who here is between the ages of 18 to 34? Raise your hands now. Raise your hand if you're between the ages of 35 and 49. Great. Now who here makes over $50,000 a year? Great, thanks. That's, so a that's... lot of straight people and a funny crowd. This could be tough. This could be tough for a comedian, for a gay comedian just trying to make his way in the world. This could be tough. But I feel good. Can anyone, can anyone beat seven years? Can anyone beat seven years? Anyone? Oh my God. Yeah, Dave, you're struggling because your audience is straight, not because you forgot to tell any jokes. What's hilarious is when you take a look at the comments on this video and see what people thought of Dave's comedy. He may be bad at comedy, but you can't deny he's great at demographic surveys. Comedy is when you take a census of the audience and white knuckle the mic stand. Now, okay, you might be saying this video that I'm reacting to here, that was posted by The Majority Report, which is a channel that isn't really a big fan of Dave. So maybe their viewers are biased. Maybe if we go to Dave's actual channel and watch some of his comedy there, people will like it better. Maybe this channel is just the worst of Dave's comedy to react to for the viewers, and Dave actually has some great material out there. Well, there's only one thing we can do. Let's head over to Dave's channel and see what material Dave himself chose to put forth as an example of his best stand-up on his channel. Uh, all right, but I thought what I should do actually is take a little poll because I want to read the room. Uh, how many of you would say that you're conservatives by a round of applause? How many conservatives? <laughs> conservatives always very respectfully, you first raise your hand before you applaud. <laughs> we don't make a lot of noise. Conservative, we're conserving the applause. Uh, Conservatives, that's good. Look, that's great. You know, people with jobs and families. <laughs> you know, you're dressed right. I saw you. I could have picked you all out. It's very easy. Oh, no, oh, there's someone who's wearing clothes that fit. Probably a conservative. How many of you, how many of you are libertarians? Libertarians. <laughs> Anyone that just applauded, those are the people you can get pot from at the end of the show. <laughs> Libertarians love pot. So who here's a conservative? Who here's a libertarian? Yeah, we're back to gathering data for the census. At least he tried to put a little joke in there, but the jokes were more like just observations of stereotypes, like conservatives, yeah, I can tell because you're dressed in a nice suit. Libertarians are frat boys who smoke too much weed. Yeah, I know, I lived through 2011 too, Dave. I'm a little different in comedy form. <laughs> It's coming back. I mean, I used to do this. This is what I did. Okay. I forgot that I'm good at this. All right. I love this. This is Dave in comedy form. Dave, when he's on his show talking about serious world issues, that's that's not comedy Dave. Comedy Dave is the guy who asks everyone in the crowd their age, their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, their religious affiliation, yearly household income, and the year they were born. And the comments agree. Wow, Dave really hits it out of the park here with zingers such as conservatives conserve their applause and libertarians smoke pot. Really insightful stuff. Excuse me while my brain goes into recovery mode. Congratulations, it takes a lot of balls to go on stage with no material. Kudos to Ruben. I love the bit where he went around the room and asked people if they were attending his comedy show. It was hilarious. It gets me every time Dave does it. Now, Dave Rubin is a pretty solid example of this pipeline. The dude almost never does stand up anymore, except at events where his own politically curated audience will already agree with him. And for the most part, he's just a run of the mill, boring ass political commentator. The next person we're gonna talk about is very similar, except I wouldn't call him boring. I'd just call him, I guess cringe 
it's almost 2024 is it cringe to say cringe now i don't i don't care we're talking about our old friend steven crowder steven crowder is a familiar face actually being one of the main people who inspired this video steven crowder is a right-wing commentator known for his show louder with crowder and even more recently being known for going on a rant about how weird it is that the state allows his wife to divorce him how can a guy reasonably expect to have a woman in his life if the government can't force her to be there very alpha of him <laughs> Tantrum! Anyway, Steven Crowder likes to make jokes that he claims are edgy, they're unfiltered, they're not going to be toned down to pander to the Gen Z feminist sensitive sensibilities. These are real, rough, manly jokes. Or are they? Whether most people are going to find an edgy or offensive joke to be funny instead of hurtful depends on a few factors. Now, I'm going to say most people here because I know that humor is subjective and I'm not the joke police, but when it comes down to whether your jokes are going to land with a wide variety of people, whether the majority of your audience is going to find an offensive joke funny, it depends a lot on the effort that you actually put into said joke. So if I were a comedian and I went up on stage and I just said, what's the deal with men? They're dumb and useless. All men are dumb, useless drains on society and the world would be better off if they ceased to exist. And if that's all I said, that was the whole bit, most reasonable people aren't going to laugh because that's not funny, that's just mean. There's nothing to laugh at there. Just because I say after the fact, that was a joke, just because I say that it was a joke, doesn't mean it's actually going to accomplish its goal of entertaining people. There's no play on words. There's no setup and payoff. There's no subversion of expectations. There's not even any funny sound effects. Now, if I said that whole thing about I hate men or whatever while I'm falling off the stage, yeah, that could probably be a little funnier at least. But if all I do is go up on stage and shit talk someone or shit talk an entire group of people and that's it there's nothing funny or interesting in there it's just plain boring ass insults most people won't find that entertaining or funny and some people are just going to find it insulting now as an american with free speech i have the right to go up on stage and say i think men are stupid i hate straight white men men suck but I shouldn't be surprised if after that people say, that wasn't really a joke, it just kind of sounds like you actually just hate men and makes you seem kind of like a really mean bully. I could reply to that by saying, oh my god, it was just a joke, I obviously don't actually hate men, you guys are just too sensitive nowadays. I could say all those things and I have the right to say those things legally, but I would expect that the audience and the critics would then reply with something like, just because you call something a joke doesn't mean that it actually makes people laugh and the way you're communicating to the audience makes it look like you hate men more than it actually makes it look like you're a comedian. That right there is Steven Crowder's problem. He frames his real opinions as jokes. And by the way, when I say real opinion, I don't actually hate men at all. That was just an example of it looking on the opposite side of the spectrum of what he does. You sit on a throne of lies. But anyway, there's nothing in Steven Crowder's comedy that actually makes it a joke other than I guess he sometimes has silly costumes or he sometimes has badly done impressions. And then when people say, hey, Steve, this real opinion of yours is actually kind of mean and you're actually just bullying people. He's like, what? It's just a joke. Even though it's a joke that he also believes is true and also didn't have any other elements of making it a joke. Comedy doesn't have to be self-deprecating, but when all you're doing is sharing views of things that you actually do believe in and then you're always portraying yourself to be the guy who's cool and who's right about everything, you come across as a bully. I can't believe you called me a bully. That's such a left-wing tactic. You are. How dare you? you? Not all comedy requires punching up, but if all you do is punch down without any sort of self-awareness or without it being part of any sort of ironic character that you're playing, you start to actually just look like a bully. For Crowder, everything's a political team sport. In order to know how to engage with you, he needs to first know what your political labels are. And this 100% carries over into his comedy. This video is called Social Justice Warriors Get Owned in Epic Rant by Comedian Parentheses Crowder. I love that he includes his own name in parentheses after the word comedian in case we as the viewers couldn't tell who the comedian was supposed to be. It's good to cover all your bases, I agree. And this epic rant is just basically what you'd expect. Time to listen up, you silly liberal fruitcakes. I came out here, I wanted to tell some jokes. Let's do some reality checks here. Do you have any idea, sir, how pathetic it must be to be you? These people wanted to come out and have a good time, hear a few jokes, some thoughtful discussion, but your head pops off the pillow in the morning with, oh, how can I be a professional victim today? 
So people who don't like Steven Crowder are professional victims, but Steven, who claims to be a victim of the leftist big tech community, which is also ironic because leftists are usually anti-capitalist, which would also be against tech oligopolies. But anyway, Steven claims to be their victim when his YouTube channel goes and gets demonetized. And then he profits off of it by encouraging his followers to sign up for his paid content. So Steven literally does actually make money from complaining about companies being mean to him. So literally he is a professional victim. But I guess calling someone a fruitcake is a hilarious joke and it makes them a professional victim and not you instead. I don't know. Yeah, you know why? Because I'm not your gender studies professional who has to cater to your trigger warning microaggression safe space bullshit. Very original, Steven. I remember 2011 too. Unlike leftists, we have an open panel and a Q&A session because we want an open idea. Oh, I'm a racist. There you go. That's a new one. Where'd you learn that one in social human studies 101? I don't, I don't even know what that was. I, I don't think it was jokes, though. Now, the failed comedian to political commentator pipeline is not solely a conservative phenomenon. Next, we're going to talk about someone who, in the height of his career as a comedian, pretty strongly identified with the political left and then pivoted to making political commentary his bread and butter. And that is Jimmy Dore. Now, I know a lot of leftists don't really consider Jimmy Dore to be a leftist himself. They think he's too far right. And then a lot of right-wingers think Jimmy Dore is some kind of like left-leaning weak soy boy or whatever. I personally think Jimmy Dore is just kind of a weirdo. And I feel bad saying that because he's a fellow Chicago Polish Catholic, but I can't just like and dislike people based on identity politics, okay? What do you think I am, a 2010 pink-haired college feminist? To quote Steven Crowder epically owning the libs. Yeah, you know why? Because I'm not your gender studies professional who has to cater to your trigger warning microaggression safe space bullshit. Anyway, Jimmy Dore was a stand-up comedian who started performing back in 1989. In 2009, he started his political commentary channel, The Jimmy Dore Show, and also started working with the left-leaning political commentary channel, The Young Turks, where he remained until 2019, around which time he got in some trouble for around which time he also got in some trouble for alleged inappropriate remarks made to fellow Young Turks host Anna Kasparian. Funnily enough, Dave Rubin also used to work for the Young Turks. Weird, I don't know what's going on here. Now, we can say that Jimmy Dore is much less of a failed comedian than people like Dave Rubin and Steven Crowder are, solely because he did successfully perform stand-up for many years and did make a decent living off of it for a while. But nowadays, he's known not primarily as a comedian, but primarily as a political commentator. He now runs The Jimmy Dore Show, which unlike a parody show like The Daily Show or something like that, is primarily political commentary above comedy. Here's some examples. They had a vote that equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And only two people in the House voted against it. Uh, uh, spoiler alert, none of them were in the squad. Just two House members did not vote in favor of a resolution affirming Israel's right to exist. Uh, that would be Republican Thomas Massey was one of them. Uh, Rashid Tlaib did not. And by the way, you have to understand we're using the 2023 definition of right to exist. Nowadays, it means you get to do whatever you want to steamroll anybody else who's in the way. That's what right to exist means. And if anybody complains, there has to be legislation against them speaking up. That's what right to exist means in 2023. Because... You know, whenever whenever somebody comes up with a law demanding that you cannot say something, it's always the good guys at the wheel of that, is it not? Come on, right? It's never because they are hiding something as their universe is disintegrating, which it is. That's how we do things over here. Overwhelming support for something that's wrong, and then a couple of symbolic protests that don't really change anything. We're like Las Vegas in that way. The house always wins, baby. The house is always going to win. So let's get into this. Democratic Rep. Rashid Tlaib of Michigan, the sole Palestinian American in Congress, voted present. Jeez. While Republican Representative Thomas Massey of Kentucky voted against the bill that would make anti Zionism equi equal or uh, e what's the word I'm looking for? With. Anti-Semitism. The resolution affirms a wide variety of widely accepted facts about Israel and the Jewish people, including the atrocity of the Holocaust and the history of the persecution of Jews. Well, think, finally, somebody, somebody affirmed the facts about Israel, the Jewish people, including the atrocity of the Holocaust and the history of the persecution. When is somebody going to make a movie about that? So he's just reporting the news there. He had a joke in there about the house always wins and like a sort of sarcastic thing about like, oh, who's going to make a movie about the Holocaust? But other than that, this is just someone talking about the news and sharing his opinions. 
This is just the same thing Dave Rubin does. So, but James Comer and the House Oversight Committee subpoenaed him to testify behind closed doors. But Hunter Biden said he would testify in public hearing as soon as December 13th. He has nothing to hide and wants the nation to hear him. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The the acting president's (laughs) son, Hunter Biden, and I say acting president because they are directing him his entire time on stage. He has agreed to face the House Oversight Committee and testify publicly, requesting a public hearing as soon as December 13th. Your empty investigation has gone on too long. Well, let's, let's read a little bit more. Your empty investigation has gone on too long, wasting too many better used resources. It should come to an end. Hunter Biden's attorney, Abe Lowell, wrote in a letter to the chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Consequently, Mr. Biden will appear at such a public hearing on the date you notice, December 13th, or any date in December, that we can arrange. Um, so these, if it's going to be one of those hearings where everybody gets five minutes, that's just a propaganda session. That's not a real hearing. But he's going to be there? Hunter? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll watch it. I'll, I definitely watch it. I'm in. I think the next thing, had, it was like, the next slide had some hilarious thing they added to it, like, Hunter's, I, I'm a hunter. I would hang out with him if he wasn't such a, a goddamn narc. But now, laptop. but so this is so now. I mean, what could possibly be of interest, um, on a on a laptop belonging to the son of the president of the United States, who's been exposed as working for foreign nations in a capacity that would affect American policy? What? Oh well, he's also been exposed to having a sweet dawn. Yeah, he does. Flaccid, and, um. All I need, and the TV is going to tell you, TV news people are going to tell you there's nothing to see here. So quickly, imagine that's Ben Shapiro saying those words instead. You can imagine it, right? Like his views might not be exactly the same, but you can picture the words actually coming out of his mouth. This is just a guy reporting on news and inserting his opinions. This is devoid of laughter. This is just straight up political commentary. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of leftists don't really claim Jimmy Dore. And one of the main reasons is that he's kind of gone down some weird conspiracy theory routes, including not really being a big fan of the vaccines. Just a year ago, Jimmy Dore performed at an anti-vax rally. And here is an example of his jokes. You can't sue Moderna if you get injured by the vaccine because they passed a law that says you can't sue Big Pharma for vaccine injuries. And I was like, why would they pass a law like that? And they said, because it's safe. (laughs) And so, of course, I got injured and I had to deal through all kind of treatments. One of them was they put Botox in my neck for my stiff neck and it worked, but it's still embarrassing because now nobody can tell when my neck is smiling. Again, that's not really a joke. That's just him saying his opinions to a crowd who already agrees with him. That's just a regular, like, rally speech. That's not really stand-up. So far, we've discussed three stand-up comedians who pivoted to online political commentary. But what if we talk about someone whose medium remained the same, even if the content of said media shifted? Let's talk about a YouTube comedian turned YouTube political extremist. And that is J.P. Sears. Now, I'm not really sure if it's fair to call J.P. Sears a failed comedian. In terms of financial success, his comedy is actually quite successful. Dead Domain, a channel I recently did a collaboration with, check out that collaboration if you haven't yet, they spoke about their experiences having J.P. Sears come to town to perform live comedy. I was mercifully, when he came into town, and I want here, I need to, to properly explain how popular he was. Because when I had Gabriel Iglesias, who sold out stadiums, and on his current tour, the one that he, he just came through a couple months ago, our town, he wanted to stop doing stadiums and start doing smaller clubs again, which is unheard of. But Gabriel Iglesias, whatever you think of him, big name, huge name in comedy, sold out shows all weekend. We added extra shows, right? Big name, huge name. J.P. Sears, a person who, like in the chat, a lot of people do not know who he is, but conservatives do. Not only did we add multiple shows, because usually what, how they do it is two shows Friday for big, big name comics, two shows Friday, two shows Saturday. They added an extra show Friday, an extra show Saturday, and two shows on Sunday, which is the only time. I have had big names we helped. Sam Marill, 
Anthony Jeselnik, Gabriel Iglesias, none of them fucking sold out like this motherfucker. And graciously, mercifully, I completely missed him. JP Sears, sold out, sold out, sold out. Cannot, cannot express enough because... People, conservatives especially, are hungry. And we are also, regrettably, the only big comedy club within driving distance of the Idaho border. So a shit ton of people come over there from there. I think there's something interesting to be said here. Right-wingers are so desperate for a real comedian, for someone who tells actual jokes. Because sure, a lot of people might agree politically with Steven Crowder or Dave Rubin, but how many are genuinely laughing at their comedy itself? How many are actually entertained by their stand-up shows? Here we've got J.P. Sears, who, unlike these other guys, does make actual jokes. Even if I don't personally like the jokes, I can at least admit that the jokes exist. Now, what's wild about J.P. Sears is that I used to be a fan of his like a long time ago. Actually, a lot of people who make videos in similar genres as mine, anti-multi-level marketing videos, videos calling out scammers and fake business gurus, a lot of that crowd used to like him because that's what his comedy used to be about. Here's an example of his old comedy from his YouTube channel, Awaken with J.P., which has over 3 million subscribers. Essential oils work via the scientific medical principles that say, if something smells good, then it's good for you. Essential oils are powerful health and vitality boosters, and they're 100% natural. In fact, there's nothing more natural than taking 3,000 pounds of flower petals to make one ounce of oil. Nature does it all the time. So that you can have abundant health through effortless, expensive oil application, I'm going to teach you how to use essential oils. My family sleeps easy at night knowing that I have a strong commitment to making germs and dangerous bacteria smell like lemon before they infect my family. There's obvious parody there. He's parodying a representation of that essential oils MLM rep who wants to sell you on the benefits of the oils, but also inserts in there some observations about how stupid and ineffective the oils actually are. I loved the joke about how they make the dangerous germs in your home smell good before they infect you. Similarly, let's take a look at one of his videos from nine years ago, a video about how to choose which life coach guru type to follow. If you don't have a guru, you're like Neil Armstrong without a moon to protect to land on or like Lance Armstrong without drugs to pretend to not do. Point is, without a guru, you don't have the necessary middleman to elevate you to the place of cosmic glory that you want to be. You're just a weak earthling with normal levels of oxygen in their blood. You're obviously not going to have a spiritual connection without someone standing in the way between you and the spiritual realm. The word guru comes from the Greek word kangaroo, which means he who has strong legs to stand on and a big pouch to put all his little followers in. And in ancient Chinese scripture, guru means the one who everybody projects all their daddy issues onto. What's more important than their supernatural abilities is their need to tell you about their supernatural abilities. Here, JP is playing the character of the guru scammer who wants your money, but the truth keeps slipping out in the things that he says. The jokes are there. Unfortunately, JP's transformation wasn't that he gave up comedy entirely. It's that he decided to change all of his principles and make specifically politically motivated comedy that is extremely biased and extremely dishonest about the groups that he's criticizing. And he's not even against business gurus or self-help coaches or those type of people anymore. Actually, he's now a regular speaker at Tony Robbins conferences. Yeah, Tony Robbins, one of the biggest supporters of the multi-level marketing industry, probably the biggest self-help and motivational speaking scammer of all time. And now all JP does is pander to the far, far right wing, which means that most of his comedy is now about how gay people are stupid, how trans people are stupid, how COVID is stupid, how vaccines are stupid, and how the left is stupid. So let's look at his recent political comedy, like this video from one month ago called When LGBTQ Takes Over Everything. At a time when LGBTQ has won the culture war, having defeated their enemies of truth, morality, and freedom, this is their first day being in charge of everything. The internet's not working. Someone has to fix this. So we've 
finally won. We have successfully excluded everyone from society who doesn't think like us. So I guess the joke here is that when LGBTQ people run the world, no one will be there to fix the internet. I guess he's implying that gay people don't work in tech, which is not even a stereotype I'm familiar with. I'm not even sure what type of thing he's trying to play on here. A better joke would be about how everyone actually works in IT because of the beloved stereotype that the IT world is filled with secret furries and because the fact that a disproportionate number of the furry community are also part of the LGBTQ community. But what do I know? I just think furries are funny. Well, now that everybody's on board with our sentiment that you shouldn't have to work because you're entitled to be taken care of by the government, no one's working. Yeah, so tell the government to start paying for things. We are the government now, and we have no money because no one's paying income taxes because we encouraged everyone to stop working. Huh, I never really thought that far ahead. So I guess the joke here is that he's conflating all LGBTQ people with communists. I mean, what he's describing isn't even communism, but is it that he thinks being LGBTQ is an ideology, like the same way that being anti-capitalist is? It really feels like this dude got a right-wing audience and now he's just like throwing a bunch of left-leaning stereotypes into an AI generator and seeing what it spits out. It turns out a lot of parents, as progressive as they are, have a lot of problems with the teachers that we've placed in the schools. What kind of problems? Well, a lot of the parents are upset because their kids are reporting to them that they're being violated by the teachers. What? The parents must be wrong. It, it's not like the teachers are pedophiles. Yeah, far from it. They're minor attracted people. A beautiful expression of diversity and inclusiveness. I agree. But the parents are upset. Many have even called the police claiming crimes have been committed against their children. What the police do? We defunded the police, so there are no police. No LGBTQ person that I've ever heard of has ever accepted maps or what they're actually called predators as part of this demographic whatsoever. The LGBTQ community has always been about promoting safe and consensual relationships. But I guess the joke is that he doesn't think that's true. Or is the joke that gay people want to defund the police? Or is the joke that defunding the police is the same thing as eliminating the police, but he just said a minute ago that nobody's working. So if nobody works in this society, doesn't that mean that the police also don't work regardless of whether or not you defund them? Because in the society he just told us about, nobody goes to work. Again, this was just, let's type out all leftist stereotypes and throw them into a machine learning program and see what it spits out. There's no longer anything clever in here. There's no funny wording. There's no clever roasts of scammers like in the essential oils video. This is just, the left is bad and I'm gonna have a word salad to tell you why. But why are we facing extinction? Everybody is sterilized. Maybe we should do something about it. I think more abortions will help. That adds up for sure. Anything else we should do? Yeah, um, tell some of the sterilized people to identify as fertile. That should medically reverse the issue. And should we continue adding hormone blockers to the water supply? Absolutely. And uh, could you hurry up with the last thing on our agenda? I've been working for almost four minutes here and this is starting to feel like kind of an unsafe space to me. Nothing has ever felt more written by ChatGPT than that. If he's convinced that the LGBTQ community is making everyone infertile by putting hormones in the water, then why are abortions even happening if everyone's infertile in this universe? And if there are a ton of abortions that are happening all the time in this society, doesn't mean that fertility rates are fairly high to be able to conceive said child in the first place? Like, I actually wouldn't be surprised if this were really written by a bot. As Dead Domain pointed out in the clip that I showed earlier, JP is providing a conservative voice while actually committing somewhat to his comedy bits. A lot more than we can say for a guy like Dave Rubin who's basically just lazy about it. So here's my question. Did JP Sears intentionally shift his views to become a far right winger so that he could fill a gap in the market and capitalize on it? Like, obviously I can't read his mind. I can't say for sure what's going on, but I did find this video of him explaining the reasons that he changed his mind about being pro-choice. Abortion. Uh, how did you change your mind on that? So I used to, before I had a kid, I used to think like, cool, abortions, I don't think it's like great to do, but it, it's fine. It's fine. And now I've changed my mind in the sense of like when I watched the birth of my son, it was the most spiritual experience I've ever had. I understood what the miracle is and how much there's this presence of something beyond us 
when there is a baby. And so now my view of abortion is I do think it's very evil. I do. I, I think it's murder. Wow. A child. Good for you. So this dude used to make fun of spiritual grifters and people who think life coaching and essential oils are the answer to everything. And now he's having spiritual experiences so profound that they completely shift his political views to the opposite side of the spectrum. I don't buy it. That smells like pure grift to me. Now, there are plenty of other people in the realm of entertainment in general that we could cover, like Ben Shapiro being denied a job writing for The Good Wife, claiming he was being discriminated against for being conservative, despite his conservative parents also having worked in Hollywood without said discrimination, and then going on to show over and over again how he's actually just incapable of understanding movies or TV or fiction in general. I'd actually be interested in your guys' thoughts on those topics and what kinds of similar videos you'd like to see in the future. But for now, I'm off to go bomb at an open mic night and then blame all men for my lack of success in my field and then I'll make that my entire personality. Just kidding, I'm not pretty enough to get away with that. Anyway, thank you so much to Ground News for sponsoring this video today. Don't forget to check out the links in my description below. I will see you guys next week. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye! Get you some nuts! Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who.